Good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. We have apologies today from our convener, Jenny Mara, and from Willie Coffey. Uh, and at the outset, can I ask everyone in the public gallery to either switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent mode so that they don't affect the committee's work. Uh, looking at the agenda, we need to take a decision on taking business in private. So do members agree to take items four and five in private? Yep. Thank you. That's agreed. Uh, I'd like to welcome our witnesses today to look at the Children and Young People's Mental Health Report. Uh, so first of all, Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland. Good morning. Uh, Claire Sweeney, Audit Director, Performance and Best Value. Good morning. And Lee Johnson, Senior Manager, Performance and Best Value for Audit Scotland. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to invite the Auditor General for Scotland to make a brief opening statement, please. Thank you, Convener. This report looks at children and young people's mental health services across the country, um, and it finds that services are under significant pressure. Demand is increasing. Over the last five years, the number of referrals to specialist services has increased by 22%, and children and young people are also waiting longer for treatment, with more than a quarter of those who started treatment in the last year waiting more than 18 weeks. The government's mental health strategy focuses on early intervention, but we found that in practice this is limited. The current system is geared towards specialist care and responding to crisis, rather than identifying and helping young people early. Access to early intervention, early intervention services like school counselling varies across Scotland. The system is also complex and fragmented, making it difficult for children and young people to get the support they need when they need it. Accessing the right services needs to be easier for children and young people, for their parents and carers, and the professionals who work with them. We did find examples of good practice and projects that are aimed at improving services. The challenge is how we sustain those improvements in the longer term, especially when projects often rely on short-term funding. Data on spending, performance and outcomes for children and young people is limited. We don't know with any accuracy exactly how much is spent on mental health services for children and young people, or what impact that spending has. The information we do have, though, indicates that it's a small proportion of overall mental health spending. Without a clearer picture of what's happening across all four, four tiers of mental health services, it will be hard to make the improvements that are needed. That will require the Scottish Government, NHS boards, councils, integration authorities and voluntary organisations to work together with children and young people to bring about a step change in how support is provided. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I will do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you. Uh, we have many. I'd like to start with uh, Colin Beattie, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, Dr General, a th one thing that jumps out in this report, which you touched on in your opening remarks, is the issue around data and I can't even remember how many reports now that you've raised this as an issue and obviously without data you don't know if you're getting the correct outcomes you don't know if the money's being spent in the right place uh, it, it really is fundamental have those that are responsible for providing these services actually responded to the recommendations around data in your report um, I'm pleased to say that the government has accepted the findings and our recommendations from this report um, on publication, which um, is obviously an important step. Um, and the chair of the task force, which the government has commissioned um, and which is reporting jointly to the government and COSLA, um, has made this one of her early priorities in the uh, first report that she published just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there is an acceptance of the need. Um, obviously, the hard work that's now required is to actually collect that data and make good use of it. Just sort of spreading this a little bit, you know, looking across the public sector now, as I said before, we've, we've seen so many of these reports with uh, comments on lack of data. Is there generally an improvement overall? Um, I think we see pockets of improvement. Um, if, I, if you're asking me for an overall picture, um, I'd say that we still don't have the data we need, particularly in developing policy areas um, like providing, in this case, more early intervention and preventative services in health and social care more generally, what's happening in community services and primary care. Um, we tend to be very good at collecting lots of data um, in uh, tr more traditional services like hospitals um, than uh, more flexible services which are often those that are going to be preventative and I think it's one of the uh, blockages to making a reality of the government's outcomes approach is the data would let, that would let them plan and then track progress over time. 
Would it, would it be correct to say that the majority of these data disconnects come when it's local councils collecting data on one side and government collecting data on the other and somehow it doesn't come together? That, that doesn't help, but I don't think it's the whole story. Um, if we look at the integration of health and social care, um, there are certainly um, gaps in social care and gaps about the way health services and social care work together, but there's a, there are also important gaps in what we know about community health services and primary health services. I seem to vaguely remember that the government put some sort of task force together on data you know, several years ago. Am I, am I completely... Um, I don't... It, it doesn't ring a bell as a, a, an initiative in itself. We have seen lots of initiatives around things like the integration of health and social care, um, the well-being of young people more generally through the early years commitments. Um, but I, I think that's a question for government rather than for us. Mm. I mean, w one of the big things, and again, you touched on this, is the question of uh, the financial reporting as to how much is actually being spent on this particular issue. And it's hard to understand why that information isn't available, at least on a local basis. Is it simply it's not being harvested nationally, but it's actually being reported locally? Is, is that the issue? You'll see on Exhibit 9, we, tr we try and pull together what information is available on spending on these services um, across Scotland, and the numbers are so variable as to just not be credible. I'll ask Claire to talk you through some of the reasons we found for that. So we had a really, really hard time with this report in terms of getting a clear picture about how the resources were being used. Uh, the bit we could, we could see to a certain degree was how much was being spent in health, but that data itself was, was very limited. So what we've presented to you in the report are um, is as, as much as we could we could gather nationally. It, it's really not not good. Um, there are key gaps in how the information is collected locally and also how it's reported uh, nationally and, and, and publicly. Um, some of the key areas we've highlighted at Exhibit Nine. Um, so there are real inconsistencies in terms of how organisations uh, work out how much is spent, what's included, what's excluded. We found some key gaps in that. Um, so that in some areas of Scotland the information on how much is spent on community services just doesn't feature. So the information's not by any means comprehensive, but we've given you as much as we were able to collect with those heavy caveats that actually there are some significant gaps in that information. I mean, I'm looking at your paragraph 50 here where you say that the CAMS workforce has increased by 11% between 2014 and 2018. That's a, that's a fairly big increase. How, do, how does that feed through into the results, because it's not clear from your report that there's a direct correlation between the increase in, in the, the head count and what the outcomes are. You're right that it's not clear, and I think there's a couple of reasons. One um, is that uh, one of the um, findings is that the number of referrals increased by 22% over a five-year period. So although there has been that increase in the workforce, the level of demand is also increasing and increasing more quickly. Um, and just as importantly, one of the data gaps is about outcomes. It's about what difference these services are making for children and young people, um, ideally in helping to address their problems early um, and set them back into um, thriving and being able to benefit from their education as they grow up or um, getting locked into a cycle of struggling with their mental health in ways that limit their um, potential for the future. We just don't know enough about that. Again, it's something that I think Dame Denise Coyer, the chair of the task force, is very keen to um, fill. Surely the, uh, the local council, which is mainly concerned with CAMS, must have some de data on outcomes they, mu they must have something to justify the headcount increases and so forth. I think it's not quite right that it is the councils that are mainly responsible for the child and adolescent mental health services. Um, and again, I'll ask Claire to talk you through that. So overall, what we saw was our lack of clarity about how the whole system worked as a system. Um, we were looking for connections between different services and actually what we saw were um, in some areas quite a, quite a siloed approach. So we would see particular specialties focus on certain needs of children. We would see um, very broad services trying to support children in a whole range of different ways um, through local authorities, through charities, through the private sector. 
um, all of those good, you know, the good, good um, initiatives to help to try and support children are absolutely clear that uh, this can only be addressed by a range of different organisations working together more effectively. But we did see data gaps and problems throughout the system in terms of how the money is accounted for, uh, but also critically in terms of what difference any of that makes to children. So we've made a series of recommendations in the report um, that those things need to be sharpened. There needs to be a much clearer sense of what interventions work, where the money should be targeted, and monitoring what difference any of that makes to children. We've got stories throughout the report from the children and young people we spoke to in carrying out the work that told us about how frustrating it was to repeat their stories to different professionals, to be unclear about what services they could access when they really needed help, and that came from their families too. So we see it as a, as a system across a, a problem across the whole system rather than just particular parts of it. So who, sh who actually should be doing the assessment of the outcomes? So anybody who is um, providing services and support for children should be thinking about what difference their service is making, what impact that's having on children locally. Um, as the Auditor General said, the bit that we can see more clearly is data on waiting times. So it does not tell a great story, but it gives us a picture of what's happening. Uh, in terms of measuring outcomes, what difference the services make, there's a, there's a real gap there. We also highlight in the report that it's not seen as a priority in all areas of Scotland. So the integration authorities have a really key role to play here in terms of improving the, the line of sight and the, the priority that is given to those services across Scotland. It's not, it's not feeling that way, and certainly from the evidence we saw at the moment, that it's, it's a priority everywhere. But again, you're highlighting a concern there that you say that each individual organisation that's involved should be assessing it, its own outcomes, but as you, can, as you can appreciate, probably everybody will have a different criteria that they might apply. So we could end up with data that's not of much use anyway, even if there was somebody bringing it all together. And who brings it together? So it does link very clearly to the National Performance Framework. Um, so that's right that it is difficult, it's challenging across the whole public sector to get good information on outcomes. If it needs to be very locally responsive to need and different and there needs to be variety and we recognise that that is true, there still needs to be something that brings that together. So again, the simple question we would ask is how do you know that the millions that are being spent on these services are making a difference? How do you tell that that, that is happening locally? And at the moment we don't see that thread throughout the way everybody's working. Um, we see a system that's under a significant amount of pressure um, and um, lots of efforts going into harness the views of children and young people, a real policy priority around the mental health of children and young people, but what we're not seeing is that translated on the ground. I think uh, during our field work we did see examples of um, measuring outcomes locally. Um, I think what we're trying to say is that we've got no idea at a national level the outcomes that are being achieved, therefore where do you direct funding and what do you spend uh, the funding on? Um, the Scottish Government are working on developing a number of quality indicators for mental health across six different um, quality dimensions, but I think the, the issue there is that uh, we understand that boards will have choose which ones they want to um, measure, if you like. Therefore, again, that will make benchmarking very difficult. Thank you, Colin. Can I just follow up on that point, Lee Johnston, if you don't mind? I, in terms of the sharing of learning, I, because it's slightly different from the, the, the data and the financials, but on page 21 of your report, uh, you talk about NHS Ayrshire and Arran, uh, and they seem to have continued to improve performance to meet, uh, you say they've continued to meet the 18-week standard uh, consistently uh, throughout this period. Uh, so, which begs the question, how is that, what, what are they doing that's so significantly better than some of those that you reference on page 19? Uh, and how is that learning either being shared or going to be shared, uh, either as a result of this report or in general? Um, Ayrshire and Aaron are uh, 
taking a kind of whole systems approach. Um, they are working um, towards multi-agency collaboration, so uh, seconding teaching staff into the CAM service, for example, and vice versa, CAM staff uh, sitting um, within schools. Um, they're uh, using their data to understand the challenges that they're facing to then um, go on to pilot different initiatives that will um, address those challenges. Um, I think we have to be cautious because I think now what they're struggling with is how they maintain um, these different pilot initiatives with short-term funding. Um, uh, and I think the other thing to acknowledge is that different areas have uh, different needs and different challenges. So I think going forward, other areas could learn for, from Ayrshire and Aaron, but they need to look at the situation in their area and decide what different uh, pilot initiatives would suit them. Um, I think there is a number of things going on where we will see good practice being shared. Um, I was at a conference yesterday and the Youth Commission were there, for example, and I know that they will make a number of recommendations and share um, ideas and good practice. And I think the, the task force as well um, will hopefully progress that work in terms of sharing good practice. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back on the nature of funding. Uh, if I might just press you uh, on a, what is something of a local issue, because the contrast between Ayrshire and Arran that we've looked at, uh, and then you talk on page 19 about NHS Grampian and NHS Tayside, uh, which are obviously uh, of particular concern uh, to me in a representative capacity. And NHS Tayside seems to have a 21-week wait time, and NHS Tayside at 18 weeks. Uh, which is a significant waiting period. This is for first appointment, isn't it? This is where someone has an identified need uh, to, to get into the system as quickly as possible, presumably. Uh, so what are NHS Grampian and NHS Tayside doing to either address those wait times and or learn from the likes of Ayrshire and Aaron uh, to improve that performance, do you know? I think latterly in our report we do refer to uh, some good work that's going on in, in Grampian. Um, I think we have to be cautious about the waiting time figures. Um, we've, as Claire has suggested, we have um, outlined the data we had available, but we know from having looked at it more in depth, uh, different areas measure waiting times in, in different ways in terms of what, what counts as treatment starting. Um, we find sometimes it's assessment they go to and then could possibly go on to another waiting list to wait for the treatment that's decided that they need to uh, be given. Um, I think as well the differences are to do with uh, workforce capacity, as I said, issues with the way that data is collected and monitored, um, and I think changes to the referral process as well. We found that there was issues around that, about the referral criteria um, changing and therefore the number of uh, young people that, that were seen um, changed over and fluctuated over a period of time. Thank you. Ian Gray. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Um, Auditor General, you bring lots of performance audit reports to to the committee, covering a wide range of services and projects. Some of them are good, and I think later in the agenda we'll look at one that's good. Some are bad, and some are downright damning. I just wonder where you would place this report in that spectrum. Um, I think this one does highlight a real problem. Um, that we know that um, for young children, for young people, um, t dealing with mental health problems early in their lives is difficult in its own right, distressing for them, distressing for their families. And we know from the evidence that it can make a real difference to how well they're able to thrive for the rest of their lives. If they get the help and support they need early on, a relatively minor problem can be nipped in the bud. Um, they can uh, get back into full-time education. They can continue to build relationships, to build their confidence, their ability um, to flourish as, as people. If they don't, they can get into a cycle of depression, anxiety, doing less well at school, 
being less likely to um, fulfil their potential once they leave school. Um, and I think for us, that's why this is so important and why the failings that we've identified and the government's accepted matter. Um, I think for the team doing the work, hearing the um, stories of young people and the difficulties that they were encountering in, in getting some of the help that they needed, um, for really quite small reasons often, um, teachers not knowing what help was available or how to refer them, referrals being made um, that didn't meet the, the referral criteria for the service they were being sent to. They're things that should be quite straightforward to fix and yet they were having a real impact on young people's lives and that's why this one matters to us. So, so the team identified problems which are exceptional go beyond the usual difficulties that we find in uh, public bodies working together or outcomes or data. This is, this is something more than they're used to dealing with. I think it was that um, combination of what ought to be relatively straightforward interventions for lots of the young people we're talking about here being difficult to access in practice. And we've got some of the pathways described in the report. Lee, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I think it's about the, the barriers. I think there's uh, several things. Uh, the lack of um, early intervention um, and prevention services. Um, so yes, the, the um, referrals to uh, the CAM specialist service are increasing greatly, um, but we although we don't have the evidence because the, the, the data isn't there to understand what the demand for the lower level services is. We imagine that some of those young people probably don't need the specialist uh, services, therefore uh, with a better, um, you know, b better services in place at those lower tier one and two levels. Um, I think as we also suggest in the report, it feels like the four tier um, system or approach to the service uh, delivery uh, feels slightly um, not fit for purpose anymore and there's a need to relook at that and look at how we uh, provide a more person-centred uh, service to save children young people bouncing between the different tiers um, and making sure that there are those lower level services to prevent people um, being referred to CAMS or for their condition to deteriorate further. So is it fair to say that the, the report could be summarised as saying we can't go on like this? Something has to change? We say in the report that step change is required, sure. um, and I think uh, both the government and uh, the chair of the task force recognise that. Um, the challenge now is to make a reality of the uh, changes that are required. So on that challenge, the report also says that it's not clear how the government's mental health strategy will address these issues and improve outcomes. Wh why do you feel that to be the case? Um, if you look at the, uh, at the the strategy, there's 40 actions in there. Um, 15 of those relate to children and young people. Um, and I think what we found was that a lot of the actions within the strategy were very much focused on trying to understand how the system is working and the challenges that it's facing, rather than outlining um, action that was going to be taken and the outcomes that they wanted to achieve. Um, now, the government have said that they will um, develop a framework that will measure progress and outcomes, but there's no time scale for that work. Um, obviously, they, they delivered the progress uh, report against the strategy a couple of days ago. Um, and if you look at the progress there, there are things happening, but again, it, it focuses around things like the Youth Commission and the Task Force, um, and of course they are going to find, look at the challenges and figure out what's going on and what needs to change. So um, I think that's why we feel that. So, so since the, the, the report we're considering was published, a couple of things have happened. One is indeed the annual report on the strategy. Um, the other is the programme for government, where there were some announcements around uh, councillors and schools and some additional funding. So my question is, is the, the strategy, with those iterations, still inadequate to the challenge that the, the report identifies? I think we need to see the outcome of the task force and the youth commission um, and see the recommendations they've made. Obviously, we say in our report that we would like to see the task force, con task force consider the recommendations that we've made in our report. And yes, I think the funding um, for 
uh, more uh, school nurses, more school counsellors will start to make a difference. But I think, as we say in our report, it's also about looking at the way organisations are working together and to work in a more joined up and collaborative way. And, and that still <laughs> remains to be demonstrated. Yes, the that's, to that's do that. local and national bodies working together to, to look at that and, and take that forward. OK, thanks. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Alex Neil. Yeah, can I focus on the demand? Because obviously uh, the most worrying aspect is that nobody seems to have a handle on the level of demand and more importantly, not just the numbers, but what's behind the numbers, you know, what's the demand for, what kind of services uh, do people need? Uh, now, obviously, historically, as you've said, uh, there is a total lack of sufficient data on qualitative data as well as quantitative data on demand. How quickly do you think that gap can be rectified satisfactorily? So we mentioned a case study in the report uh, in Grampian where some mapping was carried out to really get to the root, to understand levels of demand, levels of need, and then start to think about what the services should look like to respond to that. So it can be done, is the message. Um, the other issue I would say that we've not touched on so far is that we, we, we did see a lot of very committed professionals who want to get this right. You know, there's a lot of frustration within the system. Um, we also highlight in the report that there are some particular groups of young children and young people who are more affected than others, and that's well known. You know, there's lots of, of research available around that. So, again, we would like to see that more clearly recognised and targeted. Um, so Exhibit 1 in the report sets out in much more detail um, the children who are more likely to have a mental health problem in Scotland. Uh, so, for example, children who are looked after through the care system, um, children who are living in more deprived areas across Scotland and we didn't see enough activity to target those children to help to give them the support that they need. So there is more to do but it can be done. A case study in the report can, sh can show how that can happen. Presumably there's a close link between children with ACEs and, uh, and children with mental health problems. Absolutely. Two things, um, the mapping exercise in Grampian, um, should that now not as quickly as possible be done and because filling the data gap on a permanent basis is a slightly longer term exercise by the time you set up IT systems and all the rest of it and we know the problems associated with them but should that map mapping exercise done in Grampian not be replicated throughout the entire country? I think it should. Um, as, as we're um, talking about what's happened here in Grampian, for me, it reminds me very strongly of what we've said on a number of occasions about um, genuinely transforming uh, care for older people. If you're going to do that, you need to know what need and demand looks like. On the whole, it's a relatively small number of people who require um, the most intensive support. And you start um, in this case in schools, um, in early learning centres, in nurseries, identifying who are the children who appear to have challenging behaviour or whose parents are struggling for a range of reasons. And you build that up from localities to the health board and gradually to a national picture. It also helps you not treat the data collection as a separate thing. As you're identifying those children, you're starting to understand what help can be provided in a nursery or in a school and what does require a referral onto a specialist service. Um, so I think that local um, intervention is always the best starting place. And can I ask, Caroline, the, the Auditor General, the, um, obviously we know historically, um, to some extent, I mean, the data that is available is historical data, but it seems to me it's a fast-changing world in terms of children's mental health and the requirements. I mean, if you take, for example, just an issue like autism, um, I think we're much better at identifying early on autism. I'm not saying we're, we're perfect, far from it, but it's a lot better than it was even 10 years ago uh, in terms of identifying children at an early age who are showing signs of possible autism. So in terms of, is there anyone looking at, you know, the trend, the changes in the nature of uh, childhood mental health and adolescent mental health? 
I'll kick off, and I'm sure colleagues may want to, to add in. Um, first of all, you're right. We don't know what's causing this increasing demand. Um, there are sort of two broad theories. One, uh, that life is genuinely more stressful for children and young people with things like social media um, playing a part. The other is that the reduction in stigma um, and greater awareness is making it easier for young people to come forward. And nobody really knows how far those two things are the case and what else might be happening. I was encouraged to see um, the proposal put forward by Dame Denise Collier in her preliminary report, which suggested moving away from the current four-tier approach that aims to cover everybody um, to something which is much more focused, first of all, on children with um, relatively mild levels of need who can be helped in schools, people <coughs> who need specialist services, and then explicitly um, focusing on children with uh, neurological problems like autism, ADHD, Asperger's syndrome, and thirdly, sorry, fourthly, children who are at risk because of deprivation, because of ad adverse childhood experiences. And it seems to me, um, without obviously second-guessing Dame Denise's expertise, that that is likely to give you a better way of understanding what's happening than treating all mental health problems as though they were the same thing. It would also give you a better understanding of what resources you need to put in place and, and what kind of expertise you need to put in place when and where as well. Yes, we, we mentioned in the report the Thrive model that is being used in, in some areas in England, and that's exactly what that model does. It looks at um, the, the different needs, the different, the different support that children and young people need, and it starts to map the resources against that. And, and I think, again, to come back to, to the Grampian example, one of the reasons that's attractive is because it gets away from a more siloed approach of, you know, you're a specialist in X, therefore that's what you, you treat children with that condition, and then almost there's... there's sometimes a lack of connection to things like general practice, schools, education. Uh, what was good in Grampian was seeing that sense of a whole system coming together to start to think about the shared responsibility for those children in that, in that local area. That's what we would like to see more of. And presumably, I mean, the government's announced basically a 6% per annum on average increase in mental health uh, resources over the next few years. Uh, presumably that additional money should be focused in, first of all, in maybe developing something like Thrive throughout Scotland uh, so that you do get a better use of resources and more targeted and earlier intervention and all the good things that we've been discussing, but also that um, the resources actually go to where they would be most effective. So yes, in the report we see it's really important to understand the levels of need, what makes a difference, before you start to think about then how you spend that resource. That's absolutely critical and it can only be done with the children and young people involved as well as the folk who are providing those good services locally. So yes, there's a need to understand it all. Right. Okay, thank you. Isn't that um, <clears throat> one of the key issues that we've got here is that there's a whole section on resourcing and it says lots of good stuff about money being put into various things. Uh, but it, it sounds like from what the committee's hearing that no one has really worked out where the most effective interventions are and at which of the four stages uh, those should be made. And also, isn't there an issue that you allude to about, uh, I think you call it non-recurrent funding? Uh, in terms of how particularly third sector organisations are able to budget uh, and say we will be able to deliver this service effectively in the future. Could you just tell us something about that? I think you've just summed up the end of the key messages of the report where we say transformation um, will only happen if there's a clear review of what works, um, a plan for how the system needs to change and a move away from relying on short-term and isolated initiatives. Um, now it's, it's easy to say that, much harder to do it. Claire, would you like to pick up what that might mean in practice? Absolutely, and, and, and I guess in a, in, a, in a practical sense, what we saw examples of were <coughs> initiatives and projects, say by the voluntary sector, being introduced because there was a pot of money, and then it wasn't clear how that would either, if it had worked, would it be mainstreamed in any way? What was the shared learning around that? And if it didn't work, where was the decision making to say, actually, for good reason, we're not continuing with that? So whilst we saw a lot of 
commitment to the overall idea of supporting children and mental health services. Um, we saw some resource against that. What we didn't see was a sense of a system learning together and working as one coherent whole. Um, so the messages in the report from children and young people about it feeling fragmented, we saw that through the way that money is counted, the way that performance is measured, and the way that there is a, a focus at the moment on short-term initiatives. And, and just sticking with the demand area that Alex Neal was talking about, <clears throat> can you tell us more about uh, the benefits of early intervention uh, and, and prevention, so the, the early stages of the, of the four, if you like, uh, and what you see as the positive outcomes that they can bring, uh, and specifically moving on to the resources that Claire Sweeney was talking about, it, it seems to me... It, 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 is it as obvious as to say extra investment at tier one and tier two logically reduces demand on tier three and four such that those who require stages three and four actually get a better service and the money is better allocated? So yes, it's been, long been a focus around health and social care services that that idea that a focus on prevention and early intervention is a good thing and will have a, a positive effect on reducing demand when so people will be less likely to get into a crisis situation. Uh, we were very careful about our language around that issue. Um, we The team talked a lot about... So we see in the report that the service is more focused on crisis and specialist need. And we're not saying that that's a bad thing. Of course, there'll always be children who need that kind of support. Um, but we're saying, actually, to the exclusion of prevention and early intervention, that is, that's not a good thing. Uh, so the shift needs to happen. There needs to be more of a shift. There needs to be a clearer picture about what works and a, and a greater commitment to that early intervention and prevention that people know makes a difference. We also think that one of the um, factors underlying the increasing number of referrals to specialist um, mental health services and the increasing number of rejected referrals is young people who could be well supported by um, lower level services closer to their home and their school, but because that, services isn't avail that service isn't available, they're being referred sort of up the chain to more intensive services that, they, that really aren't the best ones for them being rejected and clogging up the system there. So the system's under more pressure, the young person's not getting the help they need, um, and we're not um, breaking out of that cycle because we don't yet have the uh, school counsellors, trained teachers to um, spot a problem early and know who to refer it to, and a system that can respond in the best way for an individual child's needs. Uh, I'll just press you. We're going to come back to the rejected referrals in two seconds. Uh, but can I just, if you wouldn't mind developing that point, Auditor General. So what do you see, having, having written this report, as the key barriers to the early intervention that Claire Sweeney is saying is, is vital? I think there's a number of things, um, and the team know more about it than I do, but very briefly, um, I think that there's something about having the services available in the first place, um, making sure that people like teachers and GPs who are in contact with young people every day have some training in that general level of mental health and know what services are available, and making sure the system works smoothly so it's easy to, to make a referral uh, once for the right information to go, for that referral to be assessed and picked up um, where it's the right service. So again, it comes back to looking at the system as a whole rather than having separate bits of it working in isolation. Thank you. Bill Bowen. Uh, thank you, convener. Can I just echo what Claire Sweeney said and that we should give due credit to the professionals who are working hard to, to deliver the services. Um, and, you know, we're asking questions here about the system as such. And uh, we move now to rejected referrals, if I can just ask some questions on that. You speak on your um, key facts section that there's been a 24% increase in the number of referrals that are rejected um, since 2013 and 14. And further on in paragraph 25, you give some reasons why this, this occurred, um, including the young person did not meet the criteria for treatment, a lack of tier one or two services for children, experience, experiencing less severe mental health problems, and also that the referral does not give enough information. <laughs> So if I can ask a couple of questions um, around this. One, that you say there's national data is not being collected um, on reasons for rejection. Are you aware of local data being collected? And secondly, 
Is there any evidence to show that um, NHS boards, which are under the most pressure, perhaps either because of the number of referrals they receive or the level of service provision they have, apply the criteria for rejection more strictly compared to NHS boards who are under less pressure, if you follow what I mean there. Please, and please don't feel that you have to be careful with your language. I, I, locally, there probably is some data collection. I think we've, we found that uh, throughout our field work, that there are local examples of uh, collecting data, but it, you know, it's just at that national level, we have no idea what the trend of um, is in terms of rejected referrals, what the reasons are uh, for, for those rejected referrals. Um, I think it comes back to the, the lack of data. Although the, the uh, SAMH recently uh, published a report um, that the, the government commissioned uh, looking at rejected referrals and what happened to young people after uh, their referrals were rejected, and they do make a number of recommendations around that. But I think to understand better, um, we do need, again, come back to the data. To really Is that the answer to my that? first question or my second question? Sorry, repeat your so second question. The second question was, are there hotspots in, in um, health boards that are perhaps under more pressure because of more referrals or less services available? Do they reject more people because they, they know they can't treat them for whatever reason? I we, again, we simply don't know that because we don't understand the reasons behind the rejected referrals. It's not collected um, on a national level um, so that we don't understand the reasons for, for the rejected referrals. So, um, as I said, we've outlined in our report um, what we think it is that they don't meet the criteria. Um, you know, we did hear of, of children, young people who um, would have benefited from the lower level early intervention prevention uh, services and because they aren't available locally they are being referred up to CAMS so they then are rejected um, and I think as well it, it can be to do with um, yes that the referral doesn't have enough information. I was at a conference yesterday I was uh, presenting the findings from the report and there was um, an academic from the Highlands University there and she'd actually done it's a few it was about four years ago and she'd looked at the reasons for rejection um, particularly um, and there was a, it was a range of different um, you know it was more likely that uh, children young people with behavioral issues um, had been uh, rejected um, referrals from teachers for example were more likely to be rejected but that's a small scale study we need to understand what's going on um, at a national level and that again comes back to the collection of the data did she give any reason, just out of interest, why teachers' referrals might be rejected? She hypothesised that it was perhaps the, the language that they were using because they weren't a clinician, that that's why, uh, that, you know, knowing the language to use would uh, perhaps make the, the referral uh, more successful, but she didn't, she didn't know the, the absolute reason. No. Nope. No. <laughs> checking if there was. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it was just a, a, a kind of follow up on that. We're talking there about local strategies and what might be uh, failing around data collection and provision of services, which leads to the um, the inappropriate referrals. And I just didn't want to lose track, lose <clears throat> sight of paragraph seventy. In paragraph seventy of the report, it says that local mental health and wellbeing strategies focus on adults. Is the problem here that at a local level they're just isn't a strategy for children and, and young people's mental health services. It's not that it doesn't gather data or it's not working very well. There just isn't a strategy there. The strategy is for adults. So there's certainly a sense we got of the level of priority this had in certain areas. And, and there's a link potentially to our message around waiting times. Uh, where we say in the report that the waiting times have, have been a focus. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be concerned and know more about how long children are waiting to get services, but we've already highlighted the problems with the data, which made it hard to answer the, some of the previous question. Um, and for our sense is that it just does need to be a greater priority. Lots of really committed, good people working in the system um, and s some clear evidence about where the problems are, but a lack of kind of pulling together to make sure that those needs are responded to and that the money is there to make that happen. Um, so we, s we definitely see this as an issue that 
all a number of organisations need to work together very closely, including the Scottish Government and COSLA, to address. That surely is a massive disconnect between stated national priorities and local priorities on the ground, isn't it? We, we say in the report that we see a commitment in terms of policy around this issue, absolutely. It's very clear that people recognise that's, a, that's an important, important thing in Scotland. Um, but what we didn't see was that translating into practice in all areas, for sure. And that's why the, some of the recommendations um, speak to that point. There's a, a related point that I also don't want us to lose sight of further up that page in paragraph 68. Um, I think lots of the policy focus has been on the importance of integration authorities in getting this oversight of what's happening for children and young people as a whole. Um, but actually we found that only 11 of the 31 integration authorities across Scotland have got responsibility for both children's men mental health services and social work mental health services. Um, they're the ones who are best placed to do that. The other 20 clearly will find it more difficult. Uh, a few further questions, if I may, Auditor General. The, um, just coming back to Bill Bowman's issue of rejected referrals. Uh, page 18, uh, there are some reasons given for why the referrals are rejected. Uh, and I just find this, presumably what I'm hearing from your answers earlier is that there's no data. So we, we give three reasons uh, why referrals are rejected. The child or young person doesn't mean to meet the criteria for treatment, lack of services at tier one and two, uh, and the referral doesn't have enough information. And that's qualified later on at paragraph 28, uh, talking about the level of detail provided by the referrer. Uh, presumably, just for clarity, there's no data on how many uh, of the rejections fall into each of these categories. <clears throat> As we say at the beginning of the following paragraph, paragraph 26, national data on reasons for um, referral and rejection isn't collected, which makes it very difficult to be clear about that. As Lee said, the government commissioned some work from the Scottish Associ Association for Mental Health to examine um, what's happened, and they've recently published their report. Um, but that's been a specific sort of clinical audit rather than routine data collection, which we think is important. Yes. Well, uh, I would agree with you. And, it, um, and also just coming back to uh, the referrer point, because yes, if there are a lack of services, that goes towards funding and uh, supply. But the other two points, the other two reasons for rejection seem to me to go towards the um, competence of the referrer. And I don't use that in a pejorative sense, just the ability, have they got the guidelines to do it? Uh, so somebody has identified a need and said, I have a young person here who, who needs help, but because of, uh, uh, again, not pejoratively, but a failing on the part of the referrer, that young person can't access the help. And that to me sounds hugely concerning. Uh, is that a fair summary? And what's being done? I think... It it, the referrals pathway is complicated, and our, uh, we outline that in our, our, um, our report. The criteria are uh, vary uh, across all the different boards, um, and it's often not easy to follow either for the young person themselves, parents, carers, or other potential referrers who don't necessarily come from a clinical background, for example. We do outline um, some good practice in Highland where there's a primary mental health worker and they undertake a kind of triage uh, service so the young person um, goes to their GP and the primary mental health worker is there and can assess and offers almost a step up or down so if they don't think that it's appropriate to the referral to the specialist services they will step them down and vice versa if they think that they require more specialist help they'll step them up um, so I think there are pockets of good practice to try and um, address some of the referral issues but again I think as we also say laterally in our, in our report around um, training there is a need for more training um, for non-mental health specialists so teachers uh, school nurses um, uh, uh, the like and that may help address um, understanding the referrals process and what's required in more depth. On that exact point, Lee Johnson, if I may, the, uh, you talk in your report about uh, a revised role for school nurses, uh, but do you have a view on, are there sufficient school nurses uh, such that if there is this change in role, that actually will make a significant contribution to early intervention? Uh, 
or actually is it is it a good thing to do but ultimately the early intervention won't be significantly impacted by that change um i it, the, it, as we say in our report again, the school nurses have, you know, is a priority for them now. Uh, mental health and well-being, um, and they, as again we've said, they they have indicated that they require a bit more training and help in that area. But I think um, the program for government as well has also announced a significant number of school nurses will um, be brought on board. Um, so again, we need to see the impact that that has. Uh, finally, from me, I, I just wanted to press you on the data sharing aspects, because certainly at uh, page 23, uh, you talk about how multi-agency working together uh, is ultimately going to be crucial. And you also comment that the young people found it very frustrating having to repeat their histories and their, their uh, challenges to, to multiple professionals. So what is the issue with data sharing here? Is it IT, for example? Is it data sharing regulations? What's going on here and what can be done to fix it? So this is something we have been looking at as part of our work on the integration of health and social care services and um, the Auditor General will be bringing a report to the committee later in the year on that issue to look at it in the round. Um, so some of the issues that we've seen through this piece of work uh, were around the quality of the records. So, for example, some areas are using paper-based records. So by definition, that makes it very difficult to share information. Um, so it was, it was a range of factors. Um, we talked earlier in the report about... Um, the need for trust and relationships and actually that goes for the professionals working in the system just as much as it does for the children and young people who need the support um, so we see information and data sharing as just one 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 part of that um, use of paper records doesn't help uh, but needing to understand how the system is working together what information everybody needs to know there have been developments in some part of the health system over the last few years to try and move that issue on around sharing things like emergency care summaries for people who are going into e and e um, so it can be done they can they can be worked to improve the way that information is shared across the system to make care better uh, we saw a long way to go um, for these services do colleagues have any further questions on this? No, in which case, uh, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their evidence today. That's been very useful. Thank you. Uh, and I'll suspend for five minutes to allow for a change of witnesses.
Good morning and welcome back to the uh, Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. Uh, we'd now like to move on to examine the report on the fourth replacement crossing and I would like to welcome our witnesses this morning. Welcome back Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Graham Greenhill, Senior Manager and Gillian Matthew, Audit Manager, both at Audit Scotland. Again, I'd like to invite the Auditor General to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. This report looks at Transport Scotland's management of the fourth replacement crossing project, which includes the construction of the Queensferry crossing. I'll summarise the findings under three areas, the need for a new crossing, the management of the project, and finally, demonstrating whether the intended benefits of the project have been achieved. First of all, the government identified a clear need for a replacement crossing. Corrosion of the main cables of the fourth road bridge would have meant restricting traffic from 2017, and ministers made a timely de decision to, to ensure the road connection between Edinburgh and Fife was maintained. Transport Scotland's decision to build a new cable stage bridge was cheaper than repairing the old one or building an alternative type of crossing or tunnel. Its design is intended to be easier to construct and more reliable and resilient, and Exhibit 2 on page 10 of the report sets out the key features of the new bridge. Secondly, at £1.34 billion, the fourth replacement crossing project is one of the biggest public sector infrastructure projects Scotland has seen. On a large, complex project like this, there are many opportunities for things to veer off track, and it's to Transport Scotland's credit that they didn't. In part two of the report, we highlight the good practice in the procurement project, which helped to deliver value for money. The team had the right mix of skills and experience, and they invested in the external expertise they needed early in the project. From start to finish, they demonstrated strong, consistent leadership and communicated well with contractors and stakeholder groups. They were strong on budgeting, governance, quality assurance and risk management. We think there's a lot that the wider public sector can learn from how the project was managed, and we've recommended the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland to share the lessons as widely as possible. The Queensferry crossing opened eight months later than first expected and ten weeks later than the contract end date. We concluded, however, that the reasons for this are reasonable and Transport Scotland managed the changes effectively to minimise the effect on time, cost and quality. There is, some, there is still some work to complete on the new bridge, uh, which is to be expected on this kind of project. Um, our only criticism, I think, is that Transport Scotland could have communicated this better to manage the public's expectations, and it should continue to keep the public updated on progress. Third and finally, it's too early for some of the project's wider benefits to be demonstrated, such as improving public transport across the force, cutting journey times, and boosting economic growth. We set out progress against each, each of the eight objectives in Exhibit 9 on page 36. But more detail is needed on how success will be measured in future. Transport Scotland now needs to produce a clearer plan for how it will measure the, the success of the project's wider benefits. It plans to carry out a full post-project evaluation later this year and will continue to review progress through our audit work. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, firstly, this seems to be a report that is unrelenting good news. So uh, I guess we need to congratulate the government on that. Um, there's reference throughout this report to good practice and, you know, success story after success story. Looking at other projects that have perhaps been less successful in the way they've been managed, how do, how do we effectively transfer that good practice, what's been learned in relation to this project, to other projects in the, in the public sector? We think this is a well-managed project and it's to the Government and Transport Scotland's credit that they've achieved that. Um, we have recommended that they both look at how they can uh, spread those lessons uh, more widely, not just to infrastructure projects, but I think many of the principles apply to big digital projects, for example, as well. Um, and we've produced on our own website um, a hub that pulls together all of the materials that we've developed in this area that people can refer to. Um, but I'll perhaps ask Gillian what else we think can, can be done to really make those lessons a reality and get some of the benefits in future. I think, yeah, as you say, I mean, it was a very well-managed project and um, it's not something we see that often as auditors. You'll know that in other audits and projects we've looked at that it's, it's not always the case. And one of the things I think that can't be underestimated is it's absolutely fundamental to get the right building blocks in place right from the beginning. 
the the time that's spent in actually getting the, the, the scope right and understanding the costs, the risks, optimism bias, which we um, mentioned in the report around um, you know underestimating things that can go wrong or things that you don't anticipate and you have to build in capacity for that. And I mean a lot of that is well known and we've we've um, looked at that in other reports and we've talked about what good practice is, what it looks like, how projects should be well managed. But we see, you know, that that, that doesn't always translate and there's you know various reasons for that. There's sort of time pressures, but I think a lot of it is not spending that that time at the start and getting it right before you, you proceed. So, as um, Auditor General says, there's there's a lot that can be learned from this, and not just in infrastructure projects. You know, there's a lot of generic project management lessons that can be applied to many other um, major projects. And I think it's just making sure that that's you know we've said um, recommending that Transport Scotland make sure they do that in future work, and we know that they're already. Well, throughout the project, they're making sure that lessons learned were being shared across other projects. So things like the dueling of the A9, they were starting to um, apply lessons learned to that project. But again, the Scottish Government has a, a role to play in making sure that it's shared right across the public sector. Um, yeah. Has the Government given any indication as to how they're going to do that? Not at the moment. I mean, I think the... You know, the Transport Scotland and Scottish Government have accepted that and said that they're, they're going to do that, but we don't know exactly in what way. If I can just uh, chip in there, um, one of the things that we do with every performance audit is um, we prepare an impact report, usually about um, 18 months or so after the publication of the original report. Um, so um, I'm the, the auditor of Transport Scotland, so one of the things I'll be doing is uh, looking at how the government and um, Transport Scotland are responding to this report as part of uh, my audit of Transport Scotland in the appropriate time. I think it would certainly be a shame if we didn't build on this success, uh, having proven that a, a large project can be well managed and delivered in the way that the public would expect. Uh, there seems to be no reason why it can't be done across the whole public sector if we can, if we can just take what we've learned from this. Um, there's one thing I was going to raise, which is... Paragraph 33 in your report, is, is what's detailed here normal in the trade? I've, I've not seen this before, certainly in any project coming forward. Is it simply the scale of this project that uh, these payments are made to contractors? And this is in, in relation to bidders being paid reasonable costs up to £10 million, which to me is a lot of money, uh, if the contract didn't go ahead. Is this normal? It is unusual, and as you can imagine, we looked at it very closely. Um, I'll ask Graham to talk you through what we concluded about it. Uh, there's, um, there's two separate elements here. Uh, there was the, the fact that um, the contracting, the, the tendering was under being undertaken at the same time as the uh, fourth replacement crossing bill was proceeding through Parliament. So there was always a risk that um, the bill might fail. So the bridge wouldn't proceed, uh, and that would have left uh, the contractors out of pocket. So Transport Scotland took the view that you know they would need to, if that if that kind of uh, thing happened, they would need to compensate uh, the the, um, the bidders for the costs that they had incurred. Uh, and secondly, uh, there was um, the offer there that Transport Scotland would pay up to five million pound towards the unsuccessful bidder's uh, costs. Um, that was really there to uh, ensure competitive tension still existed, that there was more than one bidder uh, in the process. Uh, and as Caroline says, um, it's, not uh, it's, it's unusual, but it's not unknown uh, for um, clients to go down this, this route. And um, I think it was really done you know, in, in, in view of the, the size of the project and the likely costs that uh, bidders would incur in developing their uh, tender proposals. From the point of view of Audit Scotland, does it seem a reasonable expense to have there? We concluded that it was, yes. 
the effect of the decisions that Transport Scotland took, I think, was to make sure the procurement remained competitive. Um, it kept uh, two bidders in uh, to the point where a decision was made that helped to keep costs down and it helped to um, generate a, a, a strong form of contract um, which was cost limited, uh, reducing the scope for cost overruns to come through. Um, as always, there's a balance for where the risks are best managed and we thought this was a reasonable decision which paid off in the end. Just to be absolutely clear, it's the unsuccessful bidder only that got 4.2 million. The successful bidder gets nothing because they're making a profit on the contract. They, they win the contract. The unsuccessful bidder was reimbursed 4.2 million for the cost of bidding, and that helped to make the procurement itself a competitive process. Thank you. Just on that point, if I may, the, um, the procurement and the bill that set this up were running concurrently. Uh, now, I understand why, uh, and if I might use your own words, Caroline Gardner, you said that paid off this time. Presumably, it might not have paid off, and we could have been... In a, so, credit where it's due, it worked this time, but is that, is that a practice that you would advocate going forward, or actually, did they get a bit lucky this time? In this case, we concluded it was a reasonable decision. Um, we were in the unusual circumstance where uh, all of the engineering evidence um, suggested that the um, the old fourth road bridge um, was likely to require restrictions on the traffic it could carry by 2017. Um, and given the time scale for a project of this scale, um, waiting longer to start the procurement process would have run the risk um, of uh, significant road closures, disruption, um, an impact on the economy of Scotland, and, and particularly Fife and the Lothians. Um, that's not to say, I think, that it would therefore be an automatic approach that should be taken for future contracts. Um, as always, I think what we're looking for here is intelligent application of the principles of good procurement and good project management, rather than a sort of cookie-cutter approach where um, something that worked for one project is automatically assumed to be the right answer for another one. That's certainly not what we're saying. Uh, and on that point, uh, you and the Accounts Commission uh, recently produced a joint report uh, summarising your findings on various major projects and procurement lessons. Uh, are you, do you have any plans to publicise that, to disseminate that report more widely? We're doing quite a lot of that, Graham. Do you want to pick that up? Uh, yes, um, we have uh, certainly made people aware of that. It, as you say, it appears on our hub, which brings together all of our relevant reports looking at major capital projects, together with this summary of findings. Uh, we have made sure that um, Transport Scotland is aware of the existence of that. We have been working uh, closely with the Institute of Civil Engineers for Scotland uh, to make them available of it, uh, to make them aware of its uh, existence. So we are continuing to to, to work and take take that forward. Thank you, Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, can I, if I can take a slightly more personal view of this, I've been crossing the fourth, either on the original bridge or the new one since I think it was 1964 when it when it opened, and I continue to do so. And I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but um, Colin Beatty's unrelenting good news is maybe from afar, from a bit closer up, um, I see unrelenting delays. The bridge opened and then it immediately closed. Um, both I and I've had correspondence from um, constituents um, who have crossed in the evening. We've been um, had two lanes closed. We've sort of bumped across on the hard shoulder. I mean, you say there's some work being being done. It, it seems to be more than some work. I mean, was this bridge actually finished when it um, when it opened? And you know, you say you're going to look in future at its um, operation. Are you going to be a little bit more um, critical of, of Transport Scotland? We have a we also have a, an empty bridge at the moment, um, virtually with no traffic on it. But we still have traffic being queued up on the on the existing bridge, the new bridge. I'll ask the team to come in in a moment. I think um, it's important for me to um, state, first of all, for the record, that the new bridge wasn't intended to increase capacity um, for traffic crossing the fourth. It was a replacement for the fourth road bridge with any increase in de demand being met through increased public transport. Um, and that's one of the uh, project objectives which is still not fully delivered. Um, so there is um, a, an element there which is um, part of our recommendation for a plan for delivering it and for uh, clear measures 
of how it's affecting it. Graham, do you want to pick up the question of snaggings and our conclusions in that area? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think it, again it's, it's quite important to recognise that snaggings is um, by no means unknown for, for any major uh, project. Um, the, there undoubtedly was a list of um, snaggings which uh, needed to be completed. Um, Transport Scotland Minister has informed Parliament of the, the list of uh, works that needed to be done. Um, none of that the snaggings prevented the, uh, the bridge from opening at the time, although you are correct in saying that um, subsequently um, there was a, a need for a temporary closure to um, level off some tarmac joints um, uh, in the bridge. Uh, the one main area of snagging which uh, remains outstanding is around painting the undersides of the bridge. Now, again, um, that was supposed to be uh, completed before it has been. It, it won't be now completed until September 2019. Um, that's largely because of the specialist equipment, uh, the, um, the, the kind of cradle that's required to get underneath to provide access to the, to, to the um, undersurface of the bridge. So that work will not be completed until the end of 2019. Uh, but again, um, that's not having any effect on the operation of the bridge. As if you try and cross the bridge in the evening and you're down to one lane and there's a long queue waiting to cross it. Uh, I mean, I think we all know snagging from when you buy a house and there's a crack up in the corner. Um, it's not as if the whole house is, you know, the roof hasn't been finished or something like that. And um, I think snagging is a term that um, implies minor repairs. If you say there's something that needs to continue till the end of 2019, and I presume we'll continue with lane closures, then I can't really agree that that suggests that there's not something wrong in the in the way the the bridge has been managed. But um, your, your report is your is your report, and I hope you'll come back to this um, as to how it's being operated afterwards. Can I ask you another question then on the um, on the cost side? In, I think, is it page 29, you talk about inflation of 5.3% being included in the, in the estimates. Is that correct? Um, so which page did you see? Uh, it's 29. 29, yeah. It's the bottom graphic. Yeah, yes. yes. Now, if I understand it, um, inflation probably came in at about zero using the appropriate index. So does that mean that a lot of the cost saving actually comes from there being no inflation? There certainly were um, savings from inflation, but other areas as well. And I think we, we set that out. Inflation saving? Um, uh, paragraph 60, uh, the third bullet point at the top of page 33, um, talks about price fluctuation costs essentially due to inflation, inflation being 60 to 205 million pound lower than first projected. So what, 200 million being saved by inflation? Which is not really, I mean, if you're saying that they've managed it very well, but inflation came in at, you know, 200 million less, that takes away quite a lot of the, the sort of trumpeted saving. That was the range that they'd allowed for. So the, the 200 million was the upper figure, but it was actually closer to the lower figure that was the saving. Um, at the time that they were estimating the costs and trying to understand the various aspects of that, obviously it was a very uncertain time. Um, you know, it was kind of around 2009, 2010, not long after economic crash. And it was quite difficult to estimate you know, what inflation was going to be over, you know, you were talking about a 10-year project. So they did allow for, you know, kind of an, an upper range, but there was a range, you know, the, the, all through the, the project. So there was a cost saving of whatever it was. How much of that was, was actually due to inflation not being as high as, uh, as they estimated? I'm not sure we're talking about cost savings. We're talking about the amount by which the total cost came in under the um, budget for the project. Is that um, 
not, not in savings in the way you're describing it. I mean, it, it came in below budget, and uh, international data suggests that nine out of ten projects like this don't, that they overrun on cost or time. What we've done in paragraph 60 is to set out uh, the key changes to the cost between 2011, um, which I think is when the contract was let, and 2017, which it, when it concluded, um, and to break it down between things like risk allowance, optimism bias, um, inflation, um, the uh, cost relating to the principal contract, um, and um, elements, other elements of the project as a whole, as opposed to simply the bridge Trying to get to whether they've done something in the management of the project that's been good, or they've just benefited from inflation being less than what they originally estimated. I frame it a bit differently. I think they let a good contract, um, which placed the risk for these elements with the contractor rather than with Transport Scotland. Um, and they were able to do that because of the work that had gone in beforehand, as Gillian suggested, in um, appraising the options and then making sure the form of the contract was competitive. Well, I don't want to labour the point. We've probably got other questions. But if you quote an original number and then you say the costs were less, how much of that less is due to inflation? That's really all I'm trying to establish. The 5.3 versus what it actually turned out to be. The, um, the price... Have the information. I'm happy to get it later or to get an explanation later. But uh, I'm not sure we can add... Sorry, Julian, go on. Yeah, so I do have... Um, a breakdown of some of the costs and what they were at the beginning of the project and at the end. So, the you know because we're we're talking about ranges here. So you know, and there's a lot of changes happening within the different figures for different reasons. But the um, at the start of construction, so we're looking at the you know when they started with the overall budget of 1.4 to 1.6 bill, um, billion pounds so overall um, estimate. That they had within that, there was um, a lower range of 91 million allowed for price fluctuation, inflation, and the final figure was around 31 million. But that was the lower range, and again, there was a higher range. But I think one of the things that you know, as we sort of set out at the beginning of part two around good project management, is that putting the time in to understand potentially around the costs. Inflation obviously is very difficult to predict. And I think at the time when they were setting up the, the, the budget, the um, SPICE did a report around looking and examining the costs. And that kind of you found that they were satisfied with the way that the, the costings around that had been made. And it was at that point, you know, including sort of economic reports, it was very difficult to estimate what inflation would be, you know, past two years in advance. Just, I think there's an element of the, how well this has been managed as a, as a good fortune inflation was less than they estimated. But I think, you, know, as we say in, in the report as well, that far too often that's underestimated and the, the, the element around optimism bias as well. And these were the things that you know, we felt that were all considered and built in very well to the project. But you know, that was monitored all the way through as well and the budget adjusted accordingly as well. I think there is an element of good fortune, but as we say in case study one on page 21, there were a number of, number of measures built into the, the contract approach which um, helped to deliver value, of, value for money. Um, the fixed price contract was one of them. The value engineering approach that let contractors suggest um, improvements to the project, all of those things fed through. So there was clearly an element of good luck in inflation, but they didn't just get lucky because inflation was low. Thank you. Alex Neal. Can I, can I ask you, Auditor General, about the wider evaluation of the impact uh, of the bridge? Um, two questions, really. Um, how broad and deep is this evaluation going to be? Is it going to be a wide-ranging economic and employment impact assessment, uh, or is it going to be narrower than that? Uh, and Secondly, does the baseline data exist for making an objective evaluation at this stage? Is this not the uh, closing the door after the horse has bolted? 
Very good question. Exhibit 9 on page 36 of the report sets out um, in graphic form what the project's objectives were, and there are eight of them, plus our assessment of whether they're achieved or whether they're still to be assessed. Um, and the wider ones that you're touching on there, things like uh, supporting sustain sustainable economic development and economic growth, are very definitely in the still to be assessed category. Um, Gillian, do you want to say a bit more about the plans Transport, Transport Scotland have for evaluation? Yeah. So they have plans to evaluate it one year, three year, five years after opening of the, the bridge. And you know, some of these, like particularly around the economic sustainability um, development, that they're going to be longer term objectives. So, but one of, the, one of the things that we have said in the report was that there wasn't enough detail in some of their plans around how they were going to measure some of these outcomes. There was quite a lot of detail around things like traffic flow and um, sort of easier to measure things, I guess. But we're not sure at what point, the other aspect was it wasn't clear at what point they were going to be able to answer or say that they had reached the outcome. So I think, you know, we wouldn't be seeing all these being um, being able to measure that they've reached these in the, the, the first evaluation after one year. But you wouldn't expect some of them to be have met by that point anyway but it's not clear at what point they're going to say right you know is it going to be three years or is it going to be five years that we can see you know what the what progress has been made against the different outcomes but to measure the outcome you also have to have figures for zero year so what was the starting point before the bridge was built so do they do they have that information Again, that's where it was less clear with some of these longer term, more difficult to measure outcomes. Uh, you know, obviously there's baseline around some of the traffic flow and things like that, but it wasn't clear. It was quite high level, the, the information or the methods that they were describing about how they were going to measure some of these outcome measures. And that's one of the things that you know, we're recommending, that there needs to be a lot more detail around how they're going to do that, what data they're going to use. They're talking about surveys or looking at um, businesses and what decisions they've made around setting up in areas around the fourth um, and how that's been affected by the project. And so not fairly well-defined um, treasury good practice in all of this. It used to be called the Green Book, I think, about how you measure economic impact um, and why they're not just following that. I think the Green Book focuses more on project appraisal rather than project evaluation, but obviously you need to follow the line through. We say a little bit in paragraph 66 about Transport Scotland's plans for evaluation, um, and the second bullet point there describes their plans, which is to compare pre-opening and post-opening employment patterns from a range of secondary sources, so they have plans there. But as Gillian says, um, what we haven't yet seen is the detail of which particular data sources they're expecting to use um, and the way in which they're going to pull that together at each of the three evaluation points that we've got. So in broad terms, the plans are there. We're just raising that caveat that at this point they're not detailed enough for us to be clear they're going to be able to demonstrate whether the benefits have been achieved or not. Do you think they might not be able to do it or they've just not got around to it? And if so, when are they going to get around to it? Um, I, my experience over the last six years of doing this job suggests that people often don't pay as much attention to evaluation after a project has been delivered or a service developed. Um, I think we feel that the plans that Transport Scotland has described to us are good in that context, but we don't yet, we can't get, yet give you the assurance that they will be able to evaluate all eight of the benefits fully. And clearly the ones around social inclusion, economic growth are the more difficult ones to do. I think Graham may want to add to that. I, I just see, but I'll be looking at that as part of the audit of Transport Scotland in the fullness of time. So when, when is your next audit of Transport Scotland, Graham? Uh, well, it, it's an annual uh, audit of the financial statements. Um, uh, the first evaluation report is expected later this year, um, so I can have a look at that as, as part of the 2018 and 19 audit of uh, Transport Scotland. I think we should make sure that's circulated to the committee when it's published to see if there's anything we want to pursue in that. Because <coughs> again, you know, the whole justification for these expenditures, huge expenditures, uh, it's to a large extent the economic impact. I mean, obviously there was a, a very urgent situation with the old bridge here, which in itself I think justified the investment, but 
uh, we might as well look at the, the wider economic benefits uh, for future <coughs> reference, if nothing else. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Ian Gray. <coughs> Thanks, uh, convener. Some of those outcomes related to um, promoting public transport uh, across the fourth and paragraph 71 tells us that <coughs> Transport Scotland uh, plans to publish an update on progress uh, in relation to its public transport strategy uh, late in this year. We're almost in October now and I just wonder if you have any information about likely publication. As far as I'm aware, that's still the plan. But you don't have any indication? I, I think to some extent the uh, thinking around the public transport strategy will be influenced by the initial evaluation which is due to um, be um, you know, finalised round about now. So um, I, I, I suspect Transport Scotland will be looking at the initial results of that evaluation work to feed into their, their wider thinking about the public transport. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Um, <clears throat> the, just a, a, a few wrap-up points. Just uh, Firstly, about the cost. Uh, so there's a key message uh, on page one, key message one, uh, around the, 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 the final costs. Uh, but the overall cost of $1.34 billion uh, includes the total costs from when it was first scoped in 2007 up to the end of a five-year maintenance period at 2022. Uh, so, given that that's projecting forward, uh, is there any risk to that cost? Do you think that there's a possibility it could increase? Um, not that we're aware of. I mean, obviously, as you say, that's still to happen, but the, but also um, the maintenance has been carried out by uh, another um, contractor that you know that does the ongoing maintenance. So the the contractor that built the bridge is responsible for some of the initial and the snagging and ongoing repairs after the first year. And then that's taken over um, by the other contractors looking after both the Queensway Crossing and the, um, the the existing fourth road bridge. So again, that's you know there's detailed costings around that and what's expected. But you know with a new bridge, you're not expecting there to be a lot of costs involved in the maintenance. Mm. The, uh, uh, I want to bring it right back to Colin Beattie's points right at the start about effectively what went right, uh, what went well here. Uh, first of all, you talk about this co-location of the uh, contractors uh, and the FRC uh, authorities, if you like. Uh, that I think you say that that allows quick decision making to happen. That allows a kind of fluid exchange of ideas. Um, is this something that could be replicated fairly easily in respect of other projects going forward? Is this something that is this part of the best practice that should be uh, replicated going forward? I think you know again it does depend on the type of project. You know this one lent itself very well to that kind of setup because you know obviously the bridge was in one location. It was it had the site office just very close to the bridge and um, where all the construction was happening. Um, and it, you know it was certainly it was something that came through really really strongly in our field work when we spoke to all you know, all the different kind of people that were involved in the project. Even you know, without prompting, that was something that came through that you know helped work really well. That everyone was in the same site. They were able to talk about issues as they rose. Um, you know, they built up really good relationships across the team and with the contractors as well. So it was something certainly that you know is in their kind of lessons learned and looking at future projects. But it depends on you know how how the project set up. So you know, looking at the, the dueling of the A9 project, so you're thinking about what lessons can be um, learned and transferred to that. But that one's you know, quite difficult in that respect of having a one site, because, you know, just the nature of the project, the A9 covers a, you know, a vast area. Um, so it's not so easy to, to transfer <coughs> things like that, but they are transferring other aspects um, you know, from lessons learned around some of the education programmes, the kind of wider stuff around involving school children, universities, um, getting people involved in STEM subjects, engineering, 
Um, so I think it's something certainly I think they would look to replicate if they can in a project that lends itself to that setup. But it doesn't, you know, different projects don't always, you can't apply everything to the same projects. Can I just come in with a wee supplement in that? Because it ties in with my question about the economic and employment impact. Um, will you, and one of the, is one of the lessons that if you um, let a big contract, particularly where, for example, the steel was procured from China, um, that the bigger the contract, actually, the less of the potential economic employment impact to the Scottish economy there is, <coughs> because these big contractors tend to, um, uh, well, first of all, they take their profits out of Scotland. They don't reinvest because they're not based here. Uh, secondly, they procure, in this case, steel, for example, which is a substantial part of the contract uh, overseas. Uh, whereas the A9, the dueling of the A9, is being done in small, much smaller chunks, uh, for obvious reasons, for pragmatic reasons. But nevertheless, one of the potential benefits of that might be that local contractors, local to Scotland, <coughs> indigenous uh, employees, uh, you know, training uh, opportunities for apprenticeships, all of that kind of stuff is much greater than what it would be if it was, you know, a huge contract like the fourth, fourth bridge. Now, I realise you can't always, with the fourth bridge, it would be very difficult to build that in anything other than one contract. But are we doing enough? to maximise the economic impact. I, you know, I, I worry at times we're just take an accountant's point of view uh, of these contracts and look at the immediate savings that are apparent to the public purse. But when you look at the wider uh, benefits foregone potentially in terms of economic and employment impact, actually the public purse might actually be losing uh, more than it could have gained. Um, I, I have to start off by uh, defending accountants and saying I don't think we do take a narrow view of just the immediate costs, but instead looking much more widely at what's being achieved. But I think in broad terms you're right. I think um, particularly at times when finance is, far, is tight, it's very easy to look at just the short-term cost and benefit of what you're trying to achieve rather than the bigger picture. Um, we know that uh, best value criteria, for example, let people take account of wider benefits than just the, the cost in pounds of a particular project or initiative. Um, and I think there's room for that to be applied right the way up through the economic strategy in thinking about some of the, the wider trade-offs that are involved, procurement, but also other investments in services like lifelong learning, retraining for adults, those sorts of things. And, and I think it is something that the public sector is increasingly aware of, and, and Transport Scotland uh, is increasingly looking at the extent to which um, subcontracting to local companies uh, is taking place in some of their big projects. Um, things like uh, the number of apprenticeships that are, are taken on uh, as part of uh, the, a major capital project. With, us, with Brexit, because obviously there are restrictions on what you can do built into the Lisbon Treaty and the like, so the e some EU rules do restrict you on how much preferential treatment you can give, for example, to local contractors. Um, and clearly, if those rules no longer apply, and we don't know yet if they will or won't, uh, when we come out of Brexit, there is potential for improving <coughs> and enhancing the economic impact of procurement policies on the Scottish economy. I'd feel more comfortable responding to that if we had more of an idea about what might happen when we leave the EU, so I'll leave it there. Absolutely. I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, final question from me, then, if I may. Uh, the, going back to the, the good practice, the successes, are you able to identify from your report, was this simply a, a confluence of serendipity and all the right things got together at the right time and it, it, yeah it, what a wonderful coincidence or are you able to say look this this was a function of some key individuals and who are they this was a function of some good planning at the start by certain agencies uh, were there any key things that happened that both can be replicated but also if, if in the case of individuals, they can be uh, used further. 
I will ask the team to talk you through the, the, the handful of key points that we think they got right that made a real difference. Um, and it's worth saying, I think, that although they did get lucky on some aspects, like inflation being low during the, light of the, during the life of the contract, they also got unlucky on weather, which was worse than um, had been the case in previous years, and they, they planned for that quite carefully. So it certainly wasn't just serendipity. Julian Graham wants to pick that up. I, I don't think you could um, put your finger on a single point which made the difference. Um, I think there was a number of factors that uh, were at play. Um, paragraph 21 on page 17 kind of indicates, uh, has a list of bullet points indicating um, critical factors for major projects to succeed. And if you look at those bullet points, the, the first three of them are, are really about planning. Good planning is essential. Uh, we're all aware of the, the five Ps when it comes to planning. Uh, the final three um, bullet points are all about how you determine your likely costs, uh, the extent to which you allow optimism bias, how you, how you get independent advice on your costs, how you compare your expected costs with other similar kind of projects. To that list, I would add um, leadership culture. Leadership culture sets the tone of, uh, for the entire project. And as we've previously said, it's all about openness and transparency. It's all about willingness to um, discuss and negotiate over problems and all parties coming together. Uh, it's about people having um, clear responsibilities um, and governance arrangements in place to actually make sure that people are held to account for uh, what they're doing. So it was really an accumulation of um, factors. But I think as well, the fact that the bridge was such an iconic structure played a part too, and there was a genuine source of pride uh, to and, and you know, everyone working together to, to deliver this bridge. And you know, and, and I think if you were to push me, I would also perhaps, you know, I, I think I think the project director um, came with a, a a very highly thought of international reputation, uh, and he delivered. Actually, because I think that's the point that I want to get to, is you know, we, we have an awful lot of uh, bodies in here, um, agencies rather than individuals, uh, where we look at the leadership, no doubt has exactly the investment you describe and the desire for things to succeed, but for some reason they, they haven't been able to deliver that. Uh, how much impact do you think it is that the project director that you refer to, for example, uh, was key to this? I mean, is it just about them? I, I, difficult to quantify, you know, the, the overall influence. Um, but all I can say is, you know, he he, he was he was well thought of, um, uh, and he pulled the full thing together. Um, you know, and, and everyone was working. Uh, in, in uh, conjunction and cooperation. I, th I would just add to that that I think you know you, what you're trying to get to you know is it one person one key thing and I don't think it is because if you didn't have all the the good planning building blocks in place you could you know you could bring a really impressive person in and you know it could still go wrong because they don't have the right team under them or you know they didn't have the right costs they didn't get the scope right so I think it definitely is a combination of all these things and that kind of page that. Graham referred to it's, you know, the, the part at the start of part two. I think that's where we've just tried to get into um, some of the you know the really key success factors. And paragraph twenty three at the bottom there, just you know, kind of summarising. If you've got all the good aspects of project management in place, obviously that's a really good start. But then it's these additional things, and it's about getting the right people with the right skills, getting people in early. Um, having good leadership, openness, transparency, and this, you know, the, the kind of team spirit and the the good working relationships. So it's all that together that just that made this work really well. Bill Bowman. Just as a final comment as an accountant, not giving an accountant's perspective. If the money aspect was good, then that's good. Having been through the whole construction phase as a user and a continuing user, and if users matter, I don't think the experience has been has been good. And that's, I don't expect you to perhaps comment on that, but that's just my my view. 
we have to look at the project in the round. Um, there are some real successes on this. We have made a, a criticism in here that we think Transport Scotland could have kept people better informed about the need for further work after the bridge had opened. Um, and I recognise that people's expectations may have been for a bridge which um, removed congestion across the fourth, and that wasn't one of the project objectives. But I absolutely share your view that the user experience is an important part of this. Do members have any further questions? In which case, I'd like to thank the Auditor General and her colleagues for their evidence this morning, and I now close the public part of this meeting as we move into private session. Thank you.